All right. Welcome to the pod, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I would love to start off by um, just asking you to give a brief background on yourself, uh, maybe a 30 second uh, overview, and then I want to do a deep dive into your story and your work, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, Ben, thank you so much for having me. So my name is Joe Bocas, a Portuguese national based in UK for the past 22 years. I always say I have two passions, health and sport. And I'm an entrepreneur in healthcare, also a digital health influencer, social media influencer, yeah, and a keynote speaker on wearables and digital health. All right. I love it. Um, so let's take a step back here. I love the the two focuses on sport and health. You and I actually have a lot in common there. Um, you know, excited to, to dive into it. Um, but but let's jump back. Where where did this passion come from? Would love to hear your story, the full full thing. Sure. Uh, well, since I was a a, a child, I always been fascinated by sport. Uh, I didn't become a professional sportsman, but I always, when I was a kid, I only wanted to be two things or a professional sportsman, or a businessman. And I am the latter, but sometimes I kind of bring the two together, not in a professional way, but uh, I'm also into running. I started doing triathlons in my 40s. I always been in athletics. I play as a child, basketball, volleyball, table tennis, football, of course, was the main one. But you name it, I play lots of sport in my in my childhood and in Europe um, in school you have this background the physical education they do by term one term is basketball one term is volleyball one term is handball one term is football so it's a variety of sports so I always said that and um, funny enough when I came to England um, I've done all these jobs that uh, uh, people don't want to do because my uh, English skills were very very poor so I end up working in uh, hospitality as a cleaner, a kitchen porter in restaurants. It was, it was very, very, very difficult, to be honest. But then I graduated with a sports degree, again, coming back to sport. And I actually work in professional sports environment with the Youth um, Academy of Brighton and Nova Albion and projects in the community, which is now a professional a Premier League club. So I worked for Brighton and Nova Albion Football Club for over 10 years. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and what uh, what happened after that? Well, after that, the transition to healthcare was a natural progression because I was doing um, a lot of corporate work in London, uh, workshops on well-being, advising corporations on employee well-being, and um, I was delivering uh, workshops on stress management and wellness, and then my transition to healthcare. In the last seven years, I've been heavily involved in digital health innovation, more in a technology side, because I started the startup back in um, uh, 2015 with uh, another co-founder, and that led me to technology, which was not in my uh, horizons, to be honest with you. It was a bit of an accident, but in a nice way, it was a good progression to my, re- to my, to my career. I love that. Yeah, let's dive into it. What... Um... So what exactly does the startup do and how are you tackling um, health and using technology there? Sure. This startup actually didn't succeed because we went separate ways. But what led me to was um, I started to, I created a, a profile in um, in digital health. And back then in 2015, there was a lot of innovation coming out um, and um, uh, I positioned myself as an influencer, and back then, influencer was a bit of a, a, an unheard word. People used to ask me, what does that mean? And I was doing stuff on social media, posting content, sharing things. And now, as you know, Ben, influencer is an industry in his own right, in on Instagram, on social media platforms. Um, so it was, um, it was not unheard back then. And then from then, I started working with a lot of other startups on a consulting basis as a, as a partner, as a marketeer, as a B2B connector. And now I have a consulting business that works operates globally in digital health and wearables primarily. Um, and I'm based in UK, but I work primarily in Europe and the United States. So things took off. I, I became well-known in the industry. 
and now I yeah I I help other companies to enter the marketplace and connect them with opportunities and clients in different territories. Yeah, that's exciting. So I guess kind of like just to boil it down, like what is the main thesis here on 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 your health side? Um, you know, I, I know that you know one of one of your businesses. Um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Digital Salutem. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's healthcare uncomplicated. So like, let's dive into it. I want to get into the, into the thesis, like what, what's going on in the healthcare world from what you're seeing and how are you trying to fix it exactly? Sure. Well, Ben, uh, healthcare is, um, is a very peculiar industry is um, like no other uh, because it's highly fragmented um, also, it's got a lot of nuances and dynamics from the patients to the governments to public health to private interests, private healthcare organizations, innovators of all sizes, big tech companies. So, is a lot going on. And also, fixing healthcare is like um, is is my is my mission, but it's like mission impossible because. Healthcare involves one a lot of complexity, and on the other side, uh, involves money and demands um, uh, investment or from public health from from private uh, organizations. So it's a funny dynamic, and also um, a lot of companies have an interest, of course, in making healthcare. Uh, more accessible, more sustainable. But at the end of the day, because there's a lot of money involved, sometimes is a contradiction. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the United States, as you well know, is a, is a pure privatized system. I mean, you have the health insurers, but healthcare has a cost. In other countries in Europe, healthcare doesn't have a cost. For example, when I, where I am in, in UK, there is a cost for public health, but we access healthcare free of charge but having said that i feel like much more can be done and one of the things that i'm trying to do and um, i'm not sure if you check but i also have a very well known um youtube channel which i branded for healthcare and complicated to start with was digital health and wearables uh, but i want to bring all the parties together I want to bring all the stakeholders to talk about everything and anything to do with healthcare, from patient empowerment to cybersecurity to wearables to med tech devices to the dynamics to public health. The uh, two weeks ago, I actually interviewed one of the regional directors of the World Health Organization, and we talk about population health. We talk about health equity. How can we access, for example? third world countries and give them better access to healthcare. Where we are, we live in in, in a privileged uh, way that we access healthcare and things are things are work, even though they perhaps have a cost. But if we talk about countries like uh, India, Africa, and the certain populations, they don't really have any access whatsoever. So my interest is to push this agenda forward involve the parties and also make the community bigger to talk about all these issues. And I'm, of course, on my own, I cannot fix healthcare. And no one can in a way because it's an ongoing uh, task. But I believe bringing together all um, stakeholders and different uh, interests and people to discuss the fundamental issues. I was at IMSS in Chicago and I was in Lisbon. And it was very good because we talk about actually what's going on in terms of the world, in terms of healthcare, in terms of health equity, and lots of different voices are actually interested in doing the right thing. And that's what I'm interested in, in is doing the right thing and bringing uh, all these issues to the forefront of the equation, to be honest. Yeah, it's interesting. I think probably one of the most um difficult things in that mission to bring everybody together is that a lot of the incentives are not aligned like for example it would appear that a lot of doctors and physicians want to help patients stay healthy as opposed to like you know preventative care as opposed to going into more once they get sick and then try to fix them care right because that would be better for the patient however 
pharmaceutical companies want to treat people and they make money when people use their mm. products so that there's a perverse incentive there. Why would, why would the big pharma want that? So how are you actually bringing people together and like, how are you dealing with these different sets of incentives? And then there's lobbyists and governments involved. Governments are very much influenced by where a lot of the tax dollars are coming from. It would appear the advertising space is heavily funded by um, mm. the pharmaceutical companies and they're kind of working with the insurance companies, but it's not quite apparent exactly how all these players are working together. Like how, how are you actually bringing it together in a way that's bringing the right people to the table to bust through these, I don't know if they're gatekeepers or these, these, um, you know, legacy players that have a lot of money at stake in the form of keeping the status quo going, how it's going, like, how are you busting through that? Well, Ben, that's a fabulous insight. And, and actually, this is the most challenging thing. When I bring people together to talk about uh, healthcare, uh, at, at present, and, and I've done a lot of conferences around the world, and I meet lots of different um, other leaders. Um, at the moment, with my YouTube channel, we discuss perhaps uh, a subject at a time. We, we focus on one particular issue, one particular subject but what you mentioned there in a nutshell there is actually a major major block to do the right thing and i'll give you an example even in uk things work really well but now people are unhappy with the national health system long uh, um, uh, waiting times for operations the service is not great blah blah things could also be improved and this is in a well-developed country um and, and there are a lot of interests that you mentioned there. So, for example, why, uh, uh, for me, makes a lot of sense preventative care. Because I, I'm healthy, I want to live longer. It makes it makes sense if you invest, this is an example, a $10 in a, in a course, perhaps you pick up a return on investment 10 or 20 years down the line. Um, and I, a few years ago, in here in, in Europe, it used to be a lot of health campaigns around, for example, smoking, smoking cessation, uh, eat more fruit. They have this campaign in UK called Five a Day. They raise the awareness for the population of all ages to um, um, increase the fruit intake and the vegetable intake. It was brilliant. But for the last 10, 10 years, I have not seen anything in terms of preventative health. So we expect is, is, a, is a true a contradiction because we expect more from people in terms of self-care, don't do the burden on hospitals, the waiting times, don't actually go to the public health system as an expense, but we're not investing in health education. We're not invest, investing in well-being programs. We're not investing in educating people. Yeah. So, and what you mentioned there, the, the interests of the pharmaceutical companies are is always one of the things. And I talk to people around, around wearables and around privacy data and around a lot around of lots of different things. And this comes up, the interests, for example, there are a lot of rumors, I'm not saying it's true or false, that the um Pharma companies have an interest in data and they buy off data from suppliers because they want to do studies and they use the statistics and the patterns and everything. So people are also very suspicious when it comes to, for example, sharing of data, collaborating with the big, big players. And the dynamics that you mentioned there are actually very, very difficult, not just to overlay in a public domain, but are very difficult to solve because the large corporations have more power because they pay more tax, because they have thousands and thousands and thousands of employees, they employ people. They lobby. They, contribute, they lobby, they contribute to the economy. So it's, but this has been going on <laughs> for decades, yeah, for centuries, actually. This always happened. I mean, me and you, we can still quite young. I'm sure you're much younger than me. But we're still quite young, but this has been going on for, for, for a long time. There are always interests where money is involved. So uh, I, 
I'll give you an example, which I didn't really want to go into it. But if we see now professional soccer, football, as they called in Europe, is so much money involved. I mean, it is a bit different than healthcare, the way it operates is a different kind of um, system and everything, but it's too much money involved. It's too much money involved. People, they go, where is the money? Now is a lot of players going to uh, Saudi Arabia and the Arabic countries. They got a lot of uh, buying power. So these things happen because of, unfortunately, unfortunately at the same time, fortunately for those who benefit, but these happen because of the buying power. The money speaks louder in a way. So that's one of the things that I love healthcare. I could work in a different industry, finance, or if I was chasing the money, but I don't like that side of the healthcare. You know, that is money involved and we all need to make money. You need to make money, pay your bills. I need to make money, but I don't like that side of healthcare that perhaps we have this, um, we have this um, feeling that we're not doing the right thing for the right reason because there's a conflict of interest somewhere. And that's very difficult to solve. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to solve it because it's, <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, it seems like the, the answer is pretty clear. There's absolutely an, a blockage. I mean, there, you know, there were, there's no incentive to, to focus on that. Maybe if the maybe if there was more incentive on, yeah, I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I, yeah, I think we've I think we've properly identified that that obstacle and in those perverse incentives there. I wanted to actually jump to another issue that I see too, probably most happening the most in America, which is the the food, like what's going into our food here. I don't know if you've had a chance to study this or look into this, but. One, I don't know what's going into the food, probably a ton of terrible chemicals, probably, mm. um, you know, things that shouldn't really be going in there. And then what the the food and health um, administration or, what, you know, whatever it's called, what they're trying to tell us as far as what a healthy diet is. If we look at the food pyramid, I mean, it's fucked up. Like if you look at the – like they're saying – you want to have the starches and grains on the bottom and the smallest amount of things you should have are the vegetables and the fruits and the meat. That should, that the, the smallest thing you should have would be not the starches and not the, you should have the least of the starches and the grains and the sugars. Mm -hmm. That should be at the very top of the least amount that you should have. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on there. Again, I think it goes back to perverse incentives and that, you know, to, so there's some issues there. I don't know if you studied that, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. On this I, issue. I, yeah, Ben, I realized that I never studied that in detail. If I, if I'm honest, but the, the guidance is wrong. The, the, the messaging is wrong. And um, I, I'm not an expert in nutrition, but what I notice is, for example, I, 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 have, have, have you thought about that? If you buy, uh, let's say, fresh bread from a bakery. Next day starts to get a bit harder. You need to eat within like 24 hours, let's say maximum 48 hours. It's fresh, right? It was made yesterday, uh, uh, last night. Yeah, it's very nice. You eat it first day. Second day start to get harder. If you buy the loaves of, loaves of bread from the supermarkets, they last you a week and they're still fresh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that goes in line to what you said. God knows what is it. Well, we can go into the ingredients and these, the old ease and the, the artificial ingredients and, and the bread stays fresh for over a week. And if we think about that, that's not right. Oh. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's definitely not a natural, it's not, definitely not, not a natural, uh, you know, uh, process there, you know, so, so processed food is actually a big issue now, you know, from meat, from bread, uh, even, even they preserve, even they preserve now um, the vegetables with, with art ar artificial ingredients to, so yeah, so it's actually very difficult to be healthy nowadays, you know, because everything is somehow modified or prolonged in some, you know, I would love to have a nutritionist and a specialist in here now to really give us the 
yeah but but uh, all these things are in front of us you know and you are you are informed well educated and you have an interest in doing the right thing and buying the right thing consuming the right thing but also um yeah but most people perhaps ben they don't think like us or they're not concerned as such i'm not very concerned but i start to get more concerned as i'm aging you know because I know, for example, uh, what I used to do in my 20s perhaps is not going to serve me very well if I do the same thing in my 50s, you know? Yeah, so I'm I'm naturally inclined to try to be healthier and pay a little attention, even though I drink coffee and, and have sugar and, you know, it's kind of it's kind of impossible to be a hundred percent healthier yeah <laughs> but is uh, uh, some people drink a bit more they make excess uh, but I, I pay attention to what to what i do in elf terms if you like definitely yeah no, I've, I've been on that journey myself um getting rid of I, i've actually termed it like getting getting rid of the vices right any any drinking any any sort of drugs any sort of like um you know, the other vices, like, uh, anything that abuses the, the the chemicals in your brain. Um, I've been on a mission to, to eradicate those completely, um, from my life, you know, so that's like video games or social media. Um, I've actually I had to get rid of coffee. That one was so hard. That one was <laughs> very difficult because I personally love coffee. Now, I'm not sure if it fully counts, but I've switched to decaf and only occasionally. I don't know if that fully counts as getting rid of the vice, but you know, for the sake of the of the mm. experiment, it's good. You know, I feel like it's good enough for me there. Um, what other things? You know, you're talking about like being healthy and and being aware of this kind of stuff. What other of those things um, have you come across that removing them actually adds to your health? Um, and I'm trying to think if I missed anything. But yeah, I would love love to hear your thoughts on this. Mm. Um, as I mentioned to you, Ben, I've always been quite sporty and I, um, I'm i very active. I go to the gym. I, I, I was doing triathlons in my 40s. I trained hard. Um, I slowed down a little bit now. I have not done any competitions for a while. But I keep healthy. I go to the gym and I do cardio, I do the weights. And but one thing that I pay attention a lot now, and I'm into wearable technology, as, as, as you know. So wearables can actually be an excellent vehicle they're not yeah brilliant they're not the they're not the miracle people think i'm gonna buy a wearable i'm healthy no the the, the trick is in a behavioral change is not in a gadget itself but what i would say is paying attention to my sleep now is very important because for some reason I, um as i get older i tend my mom used to tell me that i didn't understand but as you get older you sleep less or, or you need to sleep less. And not everybody is the same, but as a rule of thumb, uh, perhaps in my 20s, I sleep eight or nine hours. Now I only need six or seven. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I try to pay attention to my sleep. And I, I see you now is a lot of studies uh, out there. And I see you now the sleep is a foundation for other elements of health, performance, concentration, even losing weight, and uh, productivity Every, everything is kind of so sleeps uh, is um is a foundation for many other aspects of my health so i try to pay attention to my sleep i keep an eye on my data and have a wearable and you know so i would say there are pillars of help from like the spiritual side the the the, the, the emotional side the physical health um, and 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 definitely, health has got many many elements. Yeah, even financial help. People talk about like um, now in in the last last twenty years, especially, I hear a lot about financial health and of course health as health as we know. But sleep is certainly one thing that I'm very interested, in, and I'm an advocate of wearables. I'd love everybody to kind of engage in some capacity with their own health and promote self-care because no one is responsible for your health and this is one thing that nobody can do for you you can have a great health system you can have a great uh, insurance policy you can have a great wearable you can have all these things but at the end of the day 
you have to be the one to look after yourself and um, 100%. Uh, yeah so i'm i'm very big on that 100 percent. yeah i love the i personally use the aura ring um and i like put it on go to sleep and then track to sleep every day one thing that i've noticed that i haven't quite been able to to fix is the i'm not getting enough rem sleep it's driving me nuts like mm. my readiness score is like and i also have an, a, a watch so i track you know i track as much as i can because i'm i'm kind of obsessed with it and like i keep a spreadsheet every day and like i you know i log all the different things of the day and do like a, a breakdown anyways um I would love to know what you've learned about sleep and how to maximize your REM sleep. For me personally, I just, I keep waking up in the middle of the night, like right when I'm about to get into REM sleep, cause we go in cycles, mm -hmm. like I wake up and then I got to go back to sleep. It's, it's, it's that that's fucked up too. And I don't know how to fix it quite, <laughs> quite so. So I would love to, to hear your thoughts on how to um, get better sleep. It's critical. Yeah. Or well, ring is great. I also use it. Uh, what I notice is I, I am a bit uh, guilty and bad if I'm honest, I'm a bit naughty because I drink coffee at night sometimes. And I notice this, I have the same issue as you. I don't have enough um, deep restful sleep, the REM sleep. I might have an hour, a peak and an hour and a bit, and the other four or five hours are a light sleep, which is not great. Um, I have the same thing. But Aura Ring gives you a bit of a warning, isn't it? Your time to sleep is approaching. And what I what I notice is when I get in actually into relaxation mode instead of trying to do I don't know work before go bed and have a coffee one hour before I go to bed and eight or nine in the evening I'm still in kind of doing mode. Um, my my REM sleep it doesn't really improve. But what I notice is at the weekends is a bit better because you seem to be more relaxed and also you watch a bit of telly and you engage in a different kind of uh, mode but i hear a lot of people saying is is different um everybody's got their own uh habits and their own way of doing things but preparing to go to bed a lot of people um talk about no devices in a room which is a very hard thing because i'm addicted to my phone and also Done. the social media mine's yeah, out yeah. mine's yeah, out yeah also the social media drive me crazy because i'm trying to check things out and anyway so Having a routine is very, very important. As you wake up in the morning and do your routine, the reverse is also, also very important. So what I would say is having a routine for the winding down is crucial too. I've got that too. I I go to the gym at like 6-ish, 6 p.m. 6 um, I've been experimenting with that because I've tried eating the last meal of the day before going to the gym and eating the last meal after going to the gym. Right now, I've been doing before. I'm going to be testing out after because I don't want to eat too close to going to sleep because that also mm -hmm. messes you up. Right. So like going to the gym at six, hitting it for an hour, hour 10. I do full body six days a week. Like I get my pump on and it's awesome. And then come home, take a shower and then relax. Like hang out with the with the fian with my fiance, with the missus. And then we usually like maybe watch a little bit of a movie or something. And then every to every night at 9 30 PM, everything's off. We go brush our teeth, head to the um head to the bedroom. And then I usually read until I fall asleep. Um, or you know, whatever other uh, whatever other extracurriculars happen. Um, and then go to sleep. And usually head hits like drift off at like 10 PM and then usually wake up around like 7 30. Still, I've been I've oh. been I've been on that uh, routine for, granted, only about two weeks I've tried this routine. So I don't know if it takes more time to fully see the effects. I'm testing that now. But that's the oh, routine. So I hear you, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good, uh, consistent routine there, uh, uh, Ben. I believe probably you need a bit longer. And also try different things. You know, people, some people that drink, I don't know, chamomile tea or have some kind of meditation in the evening or whatever. So keep experimenting and eventually you'll get the full, uh, um, your full benefit that you're looking for. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just so curious as to like, you know, how everybody else does their routine and um, yeah. What, what's your routine before you go to sleep? What is, what does that look like exactly for you? Mine is bad. 
<laughs> no, I, I I I work I work long hours and sometimes I find it difficult to, if I'm honest, to switch off completely. I I, I sleep well, but I don't sleep enough. Yeah. I see. Uh, some, if if I travel, maybe I sleep four or five hours. If I'm at home, I probably go six seven. And now I don't go above that. Maybe I should actually consider to try to change my routine and go for a bit longer somehow and also the weekends because i'm programmed to sleep six seven hours i wake up very early at the weekends which is which is not good because at the weekend you want to you want to stay in i stay in bed maybe till seven or eight but i'll wake up very early because i have a routine like wake up five five thirty i go to the gym i talk look i'm ready for work so my routine is great but in a way sometimes it can work against me <laughs> i hear you Okay, so you do gym in the morning versus the evening. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular yeah. reason for that? It suits me best because uh, I think it's part of my um, routine. And um, in the evening, I tend to think, oh, I'm starting to get tired at this 5, 6 p.m. And also the gym is uh, busy. And then I'm thinking, I'm hungry. I want some foods. And then if I come back home, I don't. Oh, so the excuses are much louder in a way. In the morning, they're louder because you wake up, oh, I'm tired, I don't want to go. And the other day, I posted some stuff on social media saying, uh, it was a bit of a provocation. I said, if I go to the gym when I feel like it, I would probably just go after Christmas eating too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably go once a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I go to the gym quite a lot, probably over 300, 300 days. You know, I go to the gym probably like five, six days a week. At me, I try to, I try to rest on Sunday. Sunday no gym. Sunday no activity. I just you know do whatever with my son. And uh, but the other six days, I always do something. On Saturday, I play tennis. The other five days, I go to the gym. Yeah, go go to the gym. But you have to trick your mind, isn't it? To go even even I'm used to it. I wake up at 5, 5.30, go to the gym. No excuses. But even though, oh, you're tired. Oh, you got this important meeting. Oh, you, your mind is always trying to kind of pull you back of the good thing. So I understand why people are unhealthy sometimes because it's actually, is more down to the behavior than actually is so easy to go and grab a burger. It's so easy to grab another coffee. And it's so easy to buy the wrong bread or the wrong... And and we all we all fighting against that. What is in front of us that is not good for us. So, going to the gym or creating healthy habits is very challenging. And also, you have to persevere, isn't it? Now, I learned that I'm I'm quite good, Ben, because I'm I'm very consistent. Even though my mind telling me, "Oh, you're tired." Yeah, I know I'm tired, but I'm gonna go anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love so. that. Yeah. See, the, my my trick is. I love reading. Like I absolutely love reading. I love the audiobooks. So I pair audiobooks with working out. So I look forward to going to the gym because I get to stop everything else and just read, which I love. So that's been like a super hack for me. So it's it's way easier for me because I really love it. And if I don't go, I feel like shit. I'm like mm. waste a day. I had a day to make myself I had a day to level up and I didn't do it. I got to go. So like, mm -hmm. I, so I, I don't know if I've tricked myself into thinking that or just prime my brain enough, but um, whatever it is, I, I absolutely love it. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the, one of my favorite parts of the day, to be honest with you. That's a, Brent, Ben, that's a brilliant app, you know, seriously, that's a brilliant combination, a combination, self-development, motivation, learning, knowledge, and physical, mental health. It, you can't get any better than that, right? <laughs> I think so. I think yeah. so. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about wearables. Um, I'm a fan. You know, I've had I use the Apple Watch um, and then the the Aura Ring, um, and yeah, track and sleep, track all the stuff. Um, how do you actually use the wearables? Like, what are you tracking? How are you tracking? What are the important things there? And yeah, maybe you could kind of give us that that deep dive. Sure. Primarily now is the sleep. I'm not interested, to be honest. Right now, yeah, I'm not interested in my steps and my physical activity for now. For example, when I was doing my triathlons, I have a Garmin and I track my cycling, my uh, the, the hours I train, and I keep an eye on everything, the nutrition, the balance, 
with even with the rest because it, when you when you when you training every day it's very very easy to let yourself go to a state of tiredness and there is no wearable for that in a state of tiredness and keep going uh, but I think what is very important with regards to wearables is acknowledging that picking one area that is important to you, whether there is the physical activity, the losing weight, the, the sleep, that you engage intrinsically with that, you know, because it must be a why. It must be a why do you use a wearable and you need to connect with that. And, and sometimes you just get, a, I don't know, wearables as a present and you don't want to use it. And I've been guilty of that. It runs out of batteries on the top of my fridge. I didn't use it for a week and there is no reason to use it. But I always like try to, I have something going on. When is the training? It was the training, the cycling, the distance of my running and the, the performance, the output, the timings and everything. So I think wearables are great and they 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 are in this i see them as um an excellent vehicle to gather data insights they can be motivational if you back them up because the motivation needs to start from from you but i think one of the things that wearables have this big gap is the lack of personalization so um it's impossible for the manufacturers to do a wearable for Joao, a wearable for ben a wearable for maria so so um, they gather sometimes too much data and sometimes it's very easily to get lost in all these things. So what I my advice to people would be engage with the wearable, with one area or two perhaps maximum that makes sense to you and then build from that. And, and that varies to me. A few years ago, the steps were very important. I'm doing 12,000, 14,000 today. Oh, yesterday I only done 7,000. No, that doesn't mean a lot to me. Also because, Ben, when I was doing the triathlons, 7,000 steps or 10,000 steps doesn't mean anything. Because if you do a long run of like two or three hours, that's like 30 or 40,000 steps. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking, well, 7,000 steps is not going to do a lot for me, you know? So, but it's down to the individual. Is down to what matters to you so wearables are great and i would love to see wearables more integrated in healthcare and you know i'm in healthcare my vision is that wearables can change the world and can change the healthcare of the future with preventative measures with management of disease diagnose early supporting uh, um, um, long-term conditions and the many many things that wearables even the pharmaceutical companies are doing clinical trials using virtual trials with wearables, with patients. So wearables are excellent, but they also bring another layer of complexity around not just the technological side, but also the behavioral side. Because we are human beings, we are imperfect. I charge my wearable over next week, I forgot, you know. So there are many things to really consider. And um, when it comes to wearables, I would like to see it more guidance and more encouragement for people to utilize them to their full capacity. Yeah, that makes sense to like pick one specific area or one thing that you really care about right now or want to focus on and use the wearable specifically for that, like getting better REM sleep, focus on the focus on the sleep wearable, et cetera, et cetera. I guess the question would be like, all right, well, what if somebody's like, I want to be immortal. I want to live forever. What, what what what's the best wearables for that? Well, I, I don't think there is one out yet, but <laughs> maybe 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 the combination of uh, I wrote a book chapter on that for a for a book actually. My vision is that the combination of artificial intelligence and wearables with data, of course, will be the game changer in healthcare. And now we're really seeing uh, artificial intelligence hitting off. I mean, for many many years it was like. Um, buzzword nothing was happening for five six seven years and now now we see chat gtpt and and they see all these technologies emerging and also now they have a true application also we even have human and humanity concerns that they could be damaging or misleading or you know um but i would say i predict that in the very near future 
in five, 10 years time, we'd see a major change with implantables, with uh, sensors around the human body in our clothing. You know, things are evolving very, very fast. The other day I came across a brilliant innovation from the United States was a smart toilet seat. So wearables and sensors, the sensors of wearables, they start going where you less expect. So instead of being on your wrist, they might be in your toilet or in your chair or in your car or in your shoes and smart shoes, smart belts, smart rings, uh, AirPods, a a a a anywhere they can go, they they will they will uh, be uh, unrecognizable, I believe. Okay, I've got a tagline for the smart seat. <laughs> Get your shit together. <laughs> oh man, that's brilliant. That, uh, man, that's brilliant. We should contact the brand. We should contact yeah. the brand. <laughs> but that's um great. yeah, no, I definitely see I definitely see a future where that's gonna it's just gonna keep going more more so in that direction. You mentioned implantables. That to me is like the final frontier. I mean, when we're you know, if we're putting chips in our brain or whatever other variations of implantables there are that gets that gets pretty sophisticated pretty quickly and pr the stakes get higher i think at that point because now we're talking about like literal cyborg a future where cyborgs are for sure a thing like right now we have bionic arms and legs and things like that but like w when it's full integration with implantables i mean maybe you can give us Give us a snapshot of what's coming. Where Where is that tech right now? And what, what do you think is coming in the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I believe it will be a matter of time. There is a study, if you uh, perhaps Google it, microships in Sweden. Sweden done a study with 3,000 people. There are highly um, major concerns around safety, about you can get an infection, you can get, I don't know, someone can chop your arm or your wrist because you got your uh, credit card information there. I mean, there are all, all, all these concerns, yeah. But in Sweden, they then a 3,000 people study using um, a very small uh, implantable chip, the size of a grain of rice with three grams only on the uh, wrist. And they have your health data, you, you can have your office key, your gym key, your credit card information. So imagine instead of in the morning, go to the office and open, or even your house and you just go. And, and I believe that will come eventually mainstream in five, 10 years time. I cannot predict it will be next year, but there are also deep concerns around, uh, well, I've got my, I don't know, my car key or, or my house on my wrist and 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 hackers they want to go anywhere they can and now they more or less always find a way if they find a way to hack big organizations they will find a way to hack a system or uh, so there are many concerns and also because it's um, implantable in your body there are concerns about infections is it detrimental to your um, body function does it conflict with your uh, organs. So there are many theses that they're not found because we're not actually there yet. So, yeah, that brings up a lot of concerns. Okay. The first one is if, if implanting there and then you have all of the things right here, what's stopping some criminal from coming? And I know it's kind of uh, macabre, but chopping off your arm right there and then, you know, going and stealing all your shit. So that's one. The second is, if they're hacking directly into you, like, can they control you at that point? How much control do they have? What if they caught, what if they cause it to like short circuit? And then there's this piece of equipment mm -hmm. or technology that's like really close to your very key arteries and vessels and, you know, the important stuff right here. Third is what happens if it runs out of battery? How the fuck mm -hmm. do you charge that? Do you just put on a watch or a, a, a charging band or something like that? Like if it's in you and it runs out of battery, how do you fix that? How do you troubleshoot technology? Like technology gets stuck. Sometimes you need to refresh it. How do you refresh mm. it? If it's in you, you can't really like, you know what I'm saying? So it brings yeah. up a lot of concerns there. I guess technology has to fix that, but those are kind of the initial things on the concerning side, but on the positive side, that would be extremely convenient. 
and that would make things way easier. But the question is like, why not just use a watch for that or something that's not, mm -hmm. that doesn't have to go in you? Like, why not just use a wearable like that? That's kind of the, the that's my question. Yeah, much easier and more uh, practical in a way, yeah. But the, the natural progression is to be smaller and integrated in your body in the future. That's the, mm. you know, it doesn't have to be, but that's the, you know, so let's see. Let's wait and see if the, well, I, Elon Musk is innovating into uh, driving uh, taxis and uh, things. So we will see. <laughs> God knows when our children are uh, adults, what's going to happen in the world. My son right. the other day was talking about, oh, yeah, yeah, one day we can have a flying taxi. Well, you know, it might be an Uber. Well, what about the accidents in the air? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we're talking about these things. With, they, they're not there, but they will eventually come one day, you know. <laughs> That's true. You know, it just so. made me think, if we're already going to tie something in, in here is basically just giving off some sort of signal or it has some sort of encrypted data and blah, 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 mm. blah. So the technology is recognizing this and that's connecting it to some sort of database that verifies you, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't it be easier to just use biometrics like thumbprints or mm. like retinal scan or you know something like that where instead of having to put tech in you, make the tech smart enough to where it can sense who you are because there are unique biometrics or unique identifiers for the human body, then we could not have to be invasive. I mean, have you come across any sort of technology like that? Well, we 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 have, for example, the I mean, in any iPhones, we have the facial recognition, and, and in healthcare, facial recognition is actually a, um, an exploited area. I've seen a technology from Israel and up that. Through facial uh, recognition, uh, they give some body uh, physiological data. Not quite reliable for medical standards. Yeah, mm. they give heart rate, they give uh, your metabolic rate, or lot lots of data to be honest. But is not quite is not FDA approved yet, and is not quite cutting the medical side yet. But it will we all come. It will it will be improved. There will be more competition. It will be more innovation around, and that's a very good point because non-invasive non Ben is always better than invasive, isn't it? In any, I mean, is for example, if we look at traditional medicine, uh, you only have an operation when is the invasive or inside or your heart or whatever that is, um, as a last resort, isn't it? So why do we want to innovate the other way around? Let's actually take the risk and do the implantables right away. So yeah, so what you, what you actually mentioned in Defend is actually uh, perhaps a much better option, a non-invasive way of doing things. Well, I guess we'll see. Uh, I think only technology is going to be able to tell us what uh, what happens. But regardless of what it does end up being, um, would love to have you back on the show. I know we're about at time here. We'd love to have you back on the show at that point, and we can break it down and talk about it more. Brilliant. Ben, thank you so much for having me. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And to everybody that is watching and listening, I want to thank you very much. Um, Y'all the best. Y'all the reason I do this. So thank you very much. And I'll see you all on the next episode. Take care.